Okay, it's going to be another classic ROH review. This is going to be All-Star Extravaganza 3. A uh, show took place WrestleMania 23 weekend in Detroit, Michigan, March 30th, 2007. So this is the show uh, right before Supercard of Honor 2. Um, and, and when I watched the show back, you know, I, I wasn't really paying attention that closely to ROH at the time. But, you know, they really could have called the show Dragon Gate Challenge 2. And I, and I kind of have a feeling that maybe they were going to name it that. Sometimes they didn't give uh, the names of the shows until they actually came out on DVD. But I don't know. Like when I, when I watched the show back, it, it could have easily been named Dragon Gate Challenge 2. But maybe because of, uh, you know, some of the events that happened on the show, they just scrapped it and said All-Star Extravaganza uh, 3. But uh, when I when I think about the title All Star Extravaganza, it's weird. You know, it, it's another one of those ROH names where when you go back to 2002, it really seemed like this was like their their biggest show of the year. And then it kind of became a show where they would just give it the name if they didn't know what to call it, like Joe versus Punk Three. They didn't really know. They didn't want to call that Joe versus Punk Three because it would have been redundant. Because you know, you had Joe versus Punk Two, which was the name of an actual show. So they just call that All Star Extravaganza Two, and uh, yeah, and, and this was just another one. I, I guess you know when you have all these different talents, you know, coming in from all over the world, you know, All Star Extravaganza is a pretty you know safe bet, you know, to sell the show. So, so that's why they call it All Star Extravaganza Three. I, I'm, I'm assuming, and I think a lot of it just had to do with the Mark Briscoe injury. I, I'm almost certain you could you could have easily called this Dragon Gate Challenge Two, but for whatever reason. Uh, they didn't, but yeah, let's get right into the show. We have uh, first match of the night. You had Cole Cabana, Matt Seidel, Adam Pierce, and Chris Hero uh, for Corner Survivor match. I-, I thought this was, you know, just a lot of fun right here. Great stuff. I thought everybody was able to show what they could do personality wise and in the ring. Cabana's in his prime. Matt Seidel was able to show, you know, this is Matt Seidel at his best. You know, he was able to show Hurricanranas, you know, all the all the athleticism that he normally shows. Pierce was able to show, you know, how great he could be as a heel. They started really... Pierce actually got the victory here. This is when Pierce started cutting more serious promos, you know, shortly after this show. And then Hero was doing the shenanigans, you know, the the uh you know all the uh entertaining stuff that he was used to so uh just a lot of stuff just great stuff with hero with the cravat you know just a combination of just comedy and just great wrestling here from all these guys so so there we go with that next match she had eric stevens squashing sugarfoot alex Payne, which was extremely short maybe the shortest match in roh history right there next up you had davy richards taking on misaki mochizuki uh, these guys would actually wrestle in the future at Dragon Gate USA Fearless. I believe maybe the fourth or fifth Dragon Gate USA show. And at this time, uh, I think, you know, Mochizuki really didn't fit the Dragon Gate mold. He was more of a combat guy. He wasn't as, like, athletic as some of the other, you know, Dragon Gate guys. So so him and Davey made for a great matchup because they, they both have the educated feet. They're both very stiff. Uh, Davey was a little bit... I was kind of taken aback by Davey's attitude here. Obviously, he was a heel, but he was just very uh, disrespectful to Mochizuki. He kept calling him Jap. He kept saying, go back to Japan, you, you piece of shit. You know, Davey was, uh, you know, this is when he was more of a prick. And, uh, yeah, so, I mean, just good stuff in terms of the, the kicks, the stiffness. You know, the, the the crowd, you know, jumped out of their seat just because of how, you know, impactful some of these kicks were. But uh, Mo- Mochizuki goes over, uh, you know, Davey Richards still up and coming at the time. Davey, was, you know, still had a ways to go. Uh, but, yeah, solid match right there. Definitely the best match on the undercard up to that point, I would say. Next up, you had Jimmy Jacobs and his girlfriend Lacey taking on B.J. Whitmer and Daisy Hayes. All right, so this was just filler right here. Obviously, you know, the very next night of Supercard of Honor 2, you know, one of the best steel cage matches in ROH history would take place between BJ and Jimmy. And, and Jimmy cut, you know, arguably a top 10 promo in ROH history after this show is over. If you haven't seen it yet, just YouTube Jimmy Jacobs prom night promo. And you could listen to the video for yourself on YouTube. Uh, you know, Jacobs cut a lot of great promos, you know, uh, right before the age of the fall started. So, uh, so yeah, you know, Jacobs and Whitmer were really just kind of brawling away from the match and and then Daisy and uh Lacey were just going at it. So they had they basically had a two shot here. You had just two shots of, you know, the action going on there, but uh, you know, Lacey actually got the feel good victory. Jimmy set up Lacey 
and she got the pinfall on uh, Daisy Hayes uh, to end this match. But, you know, this is just a crazy brawl just to set up some tension between... Uh, 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 B.J. Whitmer and Jimmy Jacobs. It is tough. It's tough because you really want to stack these shows to their potential, but at the same time, you, you don't want to give away too much because you have a, a, a mega show planned the next night, but you still want to go out there for the fans and you know give this actual crowd their money's worth. So I thought they did as good of a job as they can do. And plus, you know, Lacey. Lacey was a huge part of the Jimmy Jacobs, B.J. Whitmer storyline, so it only made sense for her to get the victory here. Uh, over Daisy Hayes. All right, so next up, you had Naruki Doi and Shingo, the ROH Tag Team Champions, taking on the Briscoes. Uh, yeah, a lot of good stuff to talk about here. And, you know, the Murder City Machine Guns uh, made an appearance after this match was over to set up their match at Good Times, Great Memories. But, yeah, you know, um, interesting booking here. You know, the funny thing about this show is at the time, uh, the Ring of Honor Tag Team Titles and the World Titles were in possession of uh, Japanese pro wrestling talents. So Naruki Doi and Shingo won the belts from the Briscoes back at Fifth Year Festival. I think it was Liverpool, uh, to be exact. And then uh, Takeshi Morishima won the ROH title from Homicide at Fifth Year Festival Philadelphia. But Morishima was nowhere to be found on these shows. I'm assuming he was wrestling in Noah. Uh, yeah, so, you know, the Briscoes won the belts back here. You know, pretty good booking. You know, the, the, the expenses weren't, you know, you were going to bring in the Dragon Gate guys in for this show. So it only made sense to have, you know, these Dragon Gate guys win the belts at the anniversary shows. So, uh, yeah, I just thought it was, it just kind of refreshed, you know, the, the whole tag team title scene to a degree. But at the same time, I don't think you want the, the, the tag team championships hot potatoing too much. All right, so this match is a disaster right here. Nowhere near as good as the Liverpool match. Um, you know, I, 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 I just feel like if, the, if this match had, you know, you know, if they were able to actually perform this match without the injury, you know, they probably were going to call this show uh, Dragon Gate Challenge too. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. Mark Briscoe just kind of did this very abrupt shooting star press, and he didn't rotate all the way over, and he ended up falling on the concrete floor. Uh, actually got a concussion. Uh, I believe there was internal bleeding. So Mark couldn't finish the match, so Jay had to go solo. And Jay basically just fought off Shingo and Doi. Pretty good stuff. I mean, if they were really improvising, especially with the language barrier, I give I give Jay Briscoe a lot of credit because I thought, you know, him and Shingo, him and Naruki Doi, they actually wrestled a hard match here. I mean, they didn't do anything spectacular in terms of spots, in terms of near falls, but it was just, you know, it was a pretty stiff match. Just, you know, it didn't seem like he was... You know, it didn't seem like they were calling spots or anything. So it definitely did come off good. Jay actually did beat Shingo. I believe it was Shingo uh, with the Jay Driller uh, to win the belts back. So Jay's like holding both belts by himself. So, I mean, it kind of looks it makes the Dragon Gate guys look like shit that they ended up losing the belts with, you know, just to one Briscoe. But, you know, they obviously with the Japanese situation with travel issues, you, you, you had to get the belts back on the Briscoes because it wasn't like, you know, that they were going to keep Naruki Doi on the American shows, you know, going into the month of April. Uh, and so then the Murder City Machine Guns came out, uh, Sabin and Shelly. And then, uh, you know, they attacked the Briscoes and they mock Mark Briscoe. They basically called him your retarded brother, which is too stupid, trying to entertain all these fans. So there was a great beatdown on the, on the Briscoes to set up their great match at, at Good Times, Great Memories, which would happen on uh, April 28th in Chicago. All right, so next up we had Yamato. Uh, taking on Pelle Primo. All right, so this was a great experience for Yamato. Um, Yamato was not very enhanced at the time. Uh, eventually became the Dragon Gate USA champion three years later. His look just uh, expanded and, and really morphed when you look back at this match. Um, but here, he was just a pretty generic guy. But, you know, this was good experience to get him over to the States. Uh, it kind of felt like two, you know, students just kind of wrestling. But Yamato gets the victory over the ROH student, Pelle Primo, and we'll move on from there. Next up, you had Nigel McGuinness uh, taking on Brent Albright. All right, so Larry Sweeney was a huge part of this show. You know, Larry Sweeney and Bruno Sammartino uh, had a great promo. 
you know, Sweeney was, uh, you know, mocking and very disrespectful to Bruno San Martino. And, and then Nigel came out to make the save, saying, we don't disrespect legends in ROH. So Sweeney and Nigel were really feuding the whole year. You know, Sweeney would, would always take shots at Nigel and call him the British limey. And, uh, you know, Hero would, would make fun of Nigel, calling him Nigel McLariot. So, yeah, I mean, the only thing that really came about the Nigel and Hero stuff was a match at Driven. Then they had a steel cage match at Breakout for the ROH World Title. But yeah, I mean the Nigel and Hero stuff. Considering the build up and the the chemistry that Nigel and Larry Sweeney had on the mic, yeah, I think that whole feud could have been uh, better promoted. You know, when you look back in retrospect. But uh, yeah, I mean this was and this is the first night that Brent Albright started associating with uh, Larry Sweeney. Uh, so I thought, I thought that was really cool, uh, because, you know, a couple years, I guess a year later, you know, Albright had that huge monster face turn when he turned on sweet and sour. But at this time he was pretty much the hired gun. He had just gotten fired by WWE. So yeah, Nigel and Brent, you know, they had some great stuff, you know, great transitions from the Lariat into the crowbar. Uh, you know, Brent did some, you know, nasty, you know, um, you know, dragon suplexes to Nigel and, uh, you know, Nigel tried to fight him off, but, Ultimately, there was interference, and Albright uh, surprisingly goes over, and he goes over the, uh, you know, the Nigel McGuinness, who they're slowly building to become ROH champion. So, yeah, great. I think this might have been Albright's debut. Yeah, so great debut for Albright. Nothing great, but, you know, I would say a solid match. All right, so next up, you had Homicide uh, taking on Christopher Daniels. It's a uh, ROH Legends match with a TNA type of feel. At the time, both guys were you know, heavily invested in TNA. At this time, you know, Daniels was wearing the face paint and he had that beard. Uh, He was more of a, uh, you know, he kind of changed his look a little bit in 2007. This was right before he kind of, you know, turned into Curry Man. Uh, But yeah, I thought Homicide looked good here. This is more about Homicide playing the baby face, Christopher Daniels playing the heel. Daniels was even teasing the best moonsault ever. And then he he flipped off the fans and said, you're not getting that. So yeah, kind of, um, you know, kind of slowly setting up the uh that that angry promo that uh Christopher Daniels cut at great good times great memories where he totally shit on the ROH fans so yeah but good stuff from Homicide and uh and Daniels right here you know just great counters to the gringo killer just uh you know p- pretty good action nothing nothing too memorable but I thought it was definitely a solid match uh Homicide got the victory and Daniels just showed a lot of frustration just a lot of anger uh, you know, really building up that promo that he was going to cut the next night. So you could definitely see it coming, you know, even on this show. All right, so next up you had, yeah, th- this, this is this is a stacked show. I wouldn't say the show was amazing from top to bottom, but, you know, there's just it's just a long show. I mean, there, there was a lot on here. I do think All-Star Extravaganza, it's, you know, it, it's probably not one of the, the bigger shows in ROH history, but... You know, All-Star Extravaganza, I mean, they have had six of them. I, I think they've had at least six or seven All-Star Extravaganzas. So, uh, so yeah, it is a very important show when you look back in retrospect. But next up, you have Roderick Strong taking on Jack Evans. Uh, so, you know, Roderick actually turned on Austin Aries and, and formed the No Remorse Corps at the, uh, the anniversary shows. So, uh, you know, and then Roderick actually attacked Jack Evans in New York City, kind of, you know, left him for dead and left him out. I'll tell you, if you're a Jack Evans fan, you got to check this show out because I feel like he cut his best promo on the show. He just cut a really serious promo. You know, you usually see Jack jumping around and acting like a, uh, I don't want to say the name, but you know what I'm trying to say. But, you know, um, yeah, so, I, and I feel like this is this is probably Jack Evans' best singles match in ROH history. Obviously, you know, some of those generation next, you know, tag matches, you know, you put those above his singles stuff. But in terms of like one-on-one singles matches, I got to say, I think this is Jack Evans' best match. And I, I think I did have this on the top 50 Roderick Strong matches. I might have had this in like the the upper 40s. But uh, but yeah, great stuff. You know, Jack wanted his revenge on Roderick. You know, they're, 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 two, they're in two different stables now. And uh, I'll tell you, man, you know, the, Jack Evans is the best guy to showcase Roderick against because he could do so many, you know, the backbreakers, the, the submissions just come off great. You know, anytime you do a submission, Danielson did this back in the day. He just made Jack look like a pretzel. The, the fallaway slam into the ring post came off great. A fallaway slam off the turnbuckle. 
Um, you know, some of the variations of the gut buster, the backbreaker from Roderick just came off great. So the only gripe about this match is Roderick is supposed to be like the top heel in the company. And but after the match is over, he gets a standing ovation because the offense just looks so sexy and spectacular. So but yeah, Jack was great. He actually busted out the Sasuke special 680 splash. Great back and forth stuff. You know, they, they got a lot of time. The most most time I think a Jack Evans singles match ever gotten. And, you know, because of the depleted roster, just a lot of star power missing. You know, it opened the door up for a guy like Jack Evans to go out there with Roderick and just, you know, rock the house. Definitely the second best match of the night. And then the main event. We got Sima, Susumo Yokosuka, Dragon Kid, and Rio Sato of Dragon Gate taking on Team ROH of Austin Aries, Delirious, Rocky, Rocky Romero, and uh, Claudio Castagnoli. So, yeah, huge chance for some of these guys, especially Claudio, Rocky, and Delirious. You know, they were able to go out there and shine in a main event. Really, the one that really uh, impressed me here is Delirious. Delirious really showed that if he's in the ring with superior talent, He's a really great wrestler. And the, the problem is, when you look at some of the biggest shows in ROH history, Delirious has had some lousy opponents. You know, guys like Ricky Reyes. You know, it's tough to have a good match with Adam Pierce when he was carrying all that weight. So you don't really think of Delirious as a great wrestler, you know, even though he's had some some really good matches with Jay Lethal and, and guys like Brian Danielson and obviously Matt Seidel at the uh, classic uh, survival of the fittest. But yeah, great stuff here, man. You know, you, you had a nice mix of styles here. It, it just, it didn't just feel like a Dragon Gate match. It's kind of like the Dragon Gate guys kind of adjusted to some of the different styles, especially with Rocky. When Rocky came in, it was more submission oriented, more strikes. You know, it, it, it didn't really feel like, oh, this is just a, you know, Dragon Gate tag spot fest. Didn't feel like that at all. Uh, Aries, was extremely over. Aries was the most over guy in the match. I'll tell you, when Aries went for the 450, the, the crowd was like shaking. I was surprised at how like incredibly over Aries was here is considering how it just seemed like the reaction wasn't there for him in New York City at the anniversary shows. But uh, yeah, Claudio was great here. He busted out the King of Swing. Uh, I thought he worked really well with these guys, but you know, MVP of the Dragon Gate was probably Sema. Sema just kind of really controlled this match. He ended up winning the the match with, I believe, a firebomb. Uh, Yokosuka and Rio Sato, they're not great. Dra I mean, when you think of some of the better Dragon Gate talents, you don't think of these guys, but you know, they were able to show how underrated they were. Sato busted out a lot of variations of German suplexes. Uh, Dragon Kid busted out a Hurricanrana. Him and Delirious work really well together. Like, if you watch Dragon Kid and Delirious go out of here, it's not like, oh, Dragon Kid is is a superior wrestler. They, they, they both came off like they were, you know, equals here. So, and Dragon Kid probably gets a lot more respect than a guy like Delirious. But, yeah. I thought this is great stuff. It had that please don't stop feel. Really underrated stuff. I, I feel like the Dragon Gate work from 2007 really went under the radar. You know, to, the 2006 uh, Super Card of Honor weekend was so groundbreaking that it almost feels like the 2007 weekend really gets kind of lost in the shuffle. When you look back at 2007, really the only match that gets a lot of love and a lot of attention is the the BJ Whitmer Jimmy Jacobs uh you know steel cage match but you know this this was an awesome match I would definitely give it four and a quarter you could even argue four and a half uh I, I just thought it was great stuff there so uh yeah big win for Sema the chemistry between Sema and Delirious you know not just in the ring but you know before the match and after the match as well uh it was just a lot of fun you know Sema is actually doing the uh you know Pull, pulling up his leg like he's 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 pissing like a dog and then after the match is over just uh you know just the, the communication between both of them you know uh i just thought it was a lot of fun it was just uh it's just something to see so yeah man and uh you know rio sato and, and yokosuka very underrated talents and uh yeah man so that's all-star extravaganza three hope you guys enjoyed the review and i'm out all right